Okay, welcome to uh, today's uh, paper's presentations, and uh, we'll kick it off with Niels Werner on TrekSwitch, JS, yes, a versatile web-based audio player for presenting scientific results. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, as you said, uh, a versatile uh, audio player for presenting scientific results. Um, I'll start with a short motivation, why we need this. Um, usually, research results are presented as text formulas. You have your objective measurements, like your signal-to-noise ratio, signal-to-distortion ratio or something. Um, and papers usually look like this, and it may take, I don't know, hours, days, weeks to understand what is actually going on in this publication. And that's pretty unfortunate because as audio researchers we're in the very unique situation that most of or many of our results are actually, you can actually listen to them. Um, so the output of your algorithm in many cases is actually an audio waveform. Um, also the figures you create or the figures you use like spectrograms or pitch contours, they actually correspond to the audio so they, there's a correspondence between the two. And that actually means that's, uh, that they're a good match for presenting them on the web. Unfortunately, researchers, they're not that good at programmers, or maybe, I don't know, usually it looks like this. So you have one image and three audio tags, and that's it. Um, and the problem is, now if you imagine this author has now created an algorithm to separate an audio into three sources maybe, and you actually want to listen to the, to the mix again. So, so if you want to interact with this audio player and then mix, mix, mix it together with this audio player and mix it together with this one, the audio tag doesn't, can't do that for you. Um, and then you have your spectrogram up here, for example. So if, if this spectrogram now corresponds to your audio, there's no way of telling where in the spectrogram you're currently playing back from. So, we want to have a way of, of combining those and, and being able to mix together the tracks conveniently for the, for the end user. Um, yeah, that's where our solution comes in. Uh, as I said, we're not that good at programmers, so we need a simple API. Um, we also want to be able to either switch between tracks or maybe mix together multiple tracks. So we can have different scenarios of mixing. Uh, we want to embed visualizations into the player because that, those help a lot, and of, obviously we want to support many browsers and formats. So, uh, One possible solution would be, for example, to, to offer raw web audio API to the developer. Uh, then they may use D3 for visualization and NPM or something for installation and maybe Webpack for bundling. But actually, web audio is nice, but it's kind of hard if, you, if you're doing it for the first time. Also, D3 is very nice, but also very hard. NPM, usually like university institution websites, they don't, they don't use NPM or they, they, they're not a, like one of these new reactive websites. They're old-fashioned HTML. They don't use NPM. And also Webpack, I don't understand anything about Webpack, so maybe that's not a good solution. So our solution is we use an HTML-only API. Um, so you're basically defining the tracks in the HTML Hopefully everybody understands what they're doing and that's, that sounds simple. Also, the author, when they're creating the, the publication, they have created figures already. So you're using MATLAB or MATPLOTLIB or something. You have your figures, you can export them to images. So maybe it makes sense to have static images for visualization because we already have them. And also because that's the old-fashioned way, just a minified JavaScript file for download. That should, should do the trick for most of, of people. But we have an NPM package, and you can use Webpack if you want to. So. And that's basically what we came up with. Uh, it's a very simple UI because, again, you have one message to convey to your, to your audience. You don't want to have a million buttons and everybody can do their own settings and everything because then your message gets lost. You only want to have the, the possibility of enabling or disabling tracks, not no volume sliders, no shifting of tracks or something. You have to do all that beforehand. Um, the static visualization is shown up top, and you can also optionally have a seek head, so you can, you can see this bar moving, and you can click to, to jump into certain positions in the audio. Uh, you can define multiple formats per, uh, per track, because browsers don't all support all, track, uh, all formats. And you can have configurable mixing options, which basically means you can define which buttons for mixing are shown. I'll show a few examples as well. 
And that's the API for that. Um, you have one container which basically wraps your entire player. You define one or, many uh, one or more tracks um, with, for example, title attributes or style attributes, and they will correspond to what is then shown in the, in the player. Um, because we need to support multiple formats, uh, each track can have one or more um, source tags, one for MP3, for example, one for AAC, one for PCM. Uh, you can also have an image in there, one or more images, um, and if you give it the class seekable, for example, you get the seek head and then you have your time correspondence in the image to the, to the audio track. And to bootstrap the whole thing, you need to have this one line of, of jQuery and, of course, the includes for the CSS and the JavaScript file. Okay, the examples. So this one is straight from the documentation pages, which are on GitHub. Um, what you can see is a big, friendly switch, power switch, essentially. Because if you imagine you have a publication and you have 10 players, each of them with 10 tracks, and you're comparing audio coders, so you can't have in, um, compressed audio formats on there. So you might have 100 WAV files on there. And if you go there with your mobile phone, you'll ruin the rest of your month because you can't go online anymore. So you, we make it a very deliberate uh, action for the user to, to actually download all the tracks and then they can start playing. So you can see the secret moving and we should hear some audio, yeah. You can also go forwards. And I can now disable single tracks. And also this, this visualization up here uh, is interchangeable. So if I solo only single tracks, you can see single visualizations. But obviously, as soon as you enable two tracks, it doesn't know what to do, so it, it'll just show the default image again. So I can go between those. Yeah, that's the first example. Now, this was an example where you could mix the, all the files back together to something that was actually useful. The next example is where you can't do that. It's actually uh, the output, uh, like the result of a publication from our institute. So this is a real-world example. Um, so in this case, we have a spectrogram up here, but also we've disabled now the possibility to mix more tracks uh, because it doesn't make any sense. In this case, the first um, line is the, what is it, the input. The second one is des the desired output, and the last one is, for example, the, the new algorithm. So if, if I play those... Yeah, you get the idea. It wouldn't make sense to mix them, so we've disabled mixing. Uh, and the last example is just to show how how crazy you ooh, oh, whatever how crazy you can go with the visualization. Uh, oops. Okay, like this maybe. So this is uh, now a drum beat separation algorithm, um, and you can see the notes up here. You can see. Some events here, um, some events there, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, in this case, the, the repeat button is also useful. Yeah, that's it. And also, again, in this case, it wouldn't make sense to mix them because some of the tracks are already mixed together, uh, versions of the other tracks. Okay, so just to real quickly how, how we did this. Uh, we obviously used the Web Audio API um, for the audio. We used Font Awesome for the, for the icons and the buttons and the, the play buttons. And we used jQuery for the interaction elements, essentially. And that brings me to the caveats because we're using jQuery and it's, it doesn't behave that well together with those modern nice frameworks like React or Vue or something. Uh, that's my experience at least. And also the CSS is not encapsulated. So this is a web presentation framework and I tried to embed the player in there and it would just ruin the whole thing. So that also brings me to the outlook. 
Maybe web components would be useful there. And web components have a thing called Shadow DOM. That would be useful here as well, because then I could separate the CSS scopes, essentially. But that's something for the, for the far, no. Future, let's say future. Um, yeah, the sources are on GitHub, so github.com slash audiolabs slash trackswitch.js. Uh, it's on npm, so npm install trackswitch. Um, yeah, you can reach me on email, GitHub, and Twitter. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Niels. Uh, super useful contribution, I think. Uh, yeah, um, I think actually, so of the website, like not all of our publications at our institute, they have a website. But of the publications that have a website, I think 90% of them are using this player. So we thought it's, it might be useful. Yeah, I may subject 50 Stanford students to it in about two weeks. Is it ready? It is, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Any questions uh, for Niels? Thanks. Hi. So I, I was... I was wondering if you thought about integrating this with a static site generator. This seems to be like a very good match because you want to uh, generate uh, static content, but at the same time you may want to separate a bit uh, the content from the markup. So you could uh, integrate this so that uh, it would be very easy to generate a website with all the uh, visualizations and, and players. Mm, uh, yeah, you could. But then the interaction would be JavaScript as well. and. So if you're injecting the HTML using JavaScript and then using JavaScript later on, I don't think it makes much of a difference. Like our website, we are using a static site generator. But you're right, the markup, like all the buttons in the player and the, all that stuff, that's generated by JavaScript uh, in, on the client side. So. so I was thinking if you converted this into a plugin, for example, for an existing site generator, that yeah. could make it easier to Yeah, generate. that's a good idea. Hi, this uh, sounds very cool. <laughs> we'll definitely use that. Um, do you do you have any uh, idea if you have uh, do you have integration with IPython notebooks or something like that? Ha, um, yeah, we've thought about it, that a lot as well, but yeah, I don't know. We we couldn't figure out figure it out. The problem is that IPython notebooks. I think the way they're bringing the audio to the to the browser side is using like this data. URL thing, and I'm not sure if Web Audio can read that. Maybe somebody knows. It can. It can? Okay. Then we that should be able awesome. to do so, yeah. Yeah, we, we've thought about that as well, but we didn't have time. <laughs> so uh, maybe just one last question, yes. sort of detail. Do you have an option for mix scaling in uh, clicking on and off tracks that are mixing? to keep it normalized, or it's up to the user to? Yes, it's up to the user. Okay. So we don't do anything there. We just linearly, we just add the stuff together, and that's it. Yeah, and simple, you know what you're doing. That's good. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, well, I guess uh, we'll thank you and uh, continue. Thanks, it was a great talk. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, next we're headed for a two million song database project with Wasabi and Bell who presented uh, yesterday on their stuff. Yeah. Okay, just a second. Is it working? Yes. So uh, this is a, a work conducted by my research team at University Côte d'Azur, IRCAM from Paris, represented by Guillaume Pellerin, Deezer, a French uh, music streaming service, a sort of European uh, Spotify, 
Radio France, that is the main public radio uh, in France, and a small uh, company called Parison that is making uh, music annotation software and uh, another thing. So it's a big project um, that will uh, last 42 months. It started uh, last January. And uh, uh, we've got a lot of money for this project. So this is rather cool as we could buy very fancy gear uh, and so on. So the goal is to build a 2 million song database uh, full of metadata coming from the cultural part of the song. I mean, grab everything from the web, from DBpedia, Music Brains, uh, iTunes, and so on, from blogs uh, written by people passionate by metal music or crazy jazz, and um, analyze all the lyrics, for, not all, but uh, the ones in English and in French, guess what they are talking about, what events uh, they are related to, what people they talk about, locations, emotions, and so on, and add to this uh, information from the audio analysis. So why 2 million and not 3 or 1.5? Because with some friends from IRCAM, we were in Florence in a bar drinking beers, and we say, hey, we like each other, we must do a project. So we started talking, and one guy said, there is a one million song database. And after a few pints of beer, we said, two million. <laughs> so that was the origin of the project. So after that, we were a bit drunk, and we decided to um, bet that we could do uh, things that are not really possible, like separate the sources from each song, separate the instruments from the two million data set. So for this, we needed to have access to the audio files, and uh, Deezer came as a partner and uh, will uh, provide, as provided, the audio files, the stereo audio files. So the big idea, the big originality is to make algorithms from the audio uh, uh, field work together with algorithms that we'll, uh, we will use for getting semantics on that. Like separate the source from the Rolling Stones, we know who is playing on that song. We know the, the band, it's two guitarists, the drummer, and a singer. We can also do some machine learning by uh, giving some extracts of Keith Richards playing the guitar so that the machine can learn its sound and so on. So, um, and also, analyzing lyrics is not easy. We found some crazy lyrics, and even a human cannot understand what it's talking about. So, Yes, we, we, uh, we have an engagement uh, on that, and uh, I'm a bit feared to tell you the truth. Okay, so also we will develop, we are developing um, uh, an open source uh, set of web services, an API and web audio enhanced client applications, uh, and uh, we plan to release the public data set because we are working also on copyrighted data like the lyrics and the audio files, and uh, obviously, we are not going to distribute this uh, without permission. So um, among the, the web audio applications, we are developing our mixing, online mixing table, online effects, online guitar amplifiers so that music school students will be able to play on a song, uh, trying to uh, replicate the sound, trying to remix the sound to understand how the engineers and the producers did their work. So the database is currently online, uh, and uh, the data set is uh, enhanced uh, all along the project. So I'm go going to make you a, a short demo. So it also works on mobile. Um, so OK, I start with a famous song. OK, let me put my glasses. I'm an old man. OK, as you see, uh, OK, I can't, OK, I, f I, ma I made a mistake, yes, of course. And uh, uh, OK, normally I should get it. So uh, I get the sound. OK, so here are the different data sources we used here. So we used uh, DBpedia, uh, we used Music Brands, Deezer, of course, uh, this is a partner, and uh, a lot of other um, data sources. Uh, we are use also grabbing data from Equip Board, and this is interesting for famous artists or band members. We've got the list of gear, the list of guitars, brands, uh, and uh, this, uh, this is um, 
uh, a data source that is uh, used crowdsourcing with geeks taking pictures on stage of the people playing and uh, zooming to know exactly the reference of the, the microphone they use and so on. So here you can see the current state. So we grabbed, um, uh, we, we haven't exposed all the data, but the data is coming, uh, the abstracts from GBpedia. This is a mix from music brands and uh, I think um, maybe it was our data source. We've got the lyrics. We can fix the lyrics because uh, are there are also data uh, crowdsourced. There are sometimes mistakes like Frank Zappa with 1P or things like that. And we've got the categories we extracted from the different data sources. So you can click on 1977 singles. And normally, normally it should answer. So maybe there are many. Yes, yeah, you've got all the singles. And if you click on uh, any of them, you will get also the same thing. So uh, a few, um, and we've matched, we matched the 30 second extracts from a Deezer. So we didn't match the 2 million songs, and matching is a big problem here. I will talk about that later. Uh, just another thing, if I go back to some famous songs, we also started including uh, some uh, multi-track player, not for scientific results, but for listening to the sounds. And with my students uh, at the music school of my village, we play guitar using the guitar amp amplifier I showed yesterday that will be included too in this application, as well with some machine learning algorithm to pre-set the different uh, settings uh, so that they match the, 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 the song. Okay, so we've got, let me try again, just show you some statistics. We've got so far, songs, uh, 2 million songs and uh, a few others. We've got uh, 200,000 albums and uh, 77,000 artists uh, in the database. Uh, how did we build that? We started from the lyrics. Uh, so we grabbed data from a website called Lyrics Wikia and starting from that, we started to match uh, the songs using DBpedia, using Deezer dataset, using uh, music brands and so on. And um, we grabbed also some synchronized lyrics coming from karaoke forums with the pitch informations. And this is useful for uh, matching the, the text on the audio, for synchronizing the text on the audio, for the algorithm we are developing together with IRCAM and my team. Um, uh, we, uh, okay, that's all. So, uh, so we've got a lot of IDs. All the IDs from the different data sources are also in the database. So today, we've got a fast database that uh, you can type and uh, see the results as you type with the REST API, API and we're using a NoSQL database with Elasticsearch to allow some um, um, misspelled uh, typing. Uh, we plan, starting now, to uh, turn this into a semantic database, an RDF graph-based database that will be run on Virtuoso, the database engine from DBpedia. And um, we, uh, we are currently uh, conducting interviews with composer, musicologists, journalists. Uh, we've got different use cases with music school teachers and uh, um, people from uh, uh, sound engineer schools. So, why isn't we, didn't we start with a semantic database? Because we wanted first to have a, a, a fast API for sim simple requests. And then we are uh, uh, starting from the needs from the, uh, our target users. We will add vocabularies and start uh, adding some uh, reasoning possibilities. And for the one of you who know semantic web, we will uh, build a, a Sparkle endpoint for that. And I know at uh, Queen Mary University, you've got a project called Music Web that is a, a bit similar to us, except in the scale, I think. And I don't think you include the lyrics analysis. I, I, I. Okay. So we identify the different needs for the vocabularies. It's segmenting music tracks in its temporal structure, segmenting the tracks into singing parts. Uh, there are a lot of ontologies about emotions. We're working on them. Uh, there is a strong need from the composers is that I'm composing something. Am I doing a plagiary, a plagiar of something? 
I don't want to be sued. Uh, so um, we are using also, uh, we are collecting information for giving to the people from the audio analysis about uh, the composition of bands, the composition, who is playing what instrument on a, on a song when it's available. Uh, you saw a multi-track player, we will need to describe the multi-track. There is a multi-track ontology I think you developed here at uh, Queen Mary University. We are looking at this very uh, closely. And um, more generally, the project will uh, give us the opportunity to define an ontology for describing eff efficiently a song over time. So this is the, the final goal about the description. So what did we collect? What did we match to? Sorry, let's okay. Okay. Uh, so we developed an API, an API. So let me just show you the API. Uh, it's here. So we've got a rather complete API where you can ask um, um, all the discography from one artist. Uh, I want to know uh, all information about a particular song. Uh, I want to know the history of, uh, I don't know, Keith Richard or what band he played also uh, in and so on. So the API is quite, quite complete right now and we are enhancing it and the, the published version does not include uh, the, the put and delete requests <laughs> and uh, you can only uh, get for the moment uh, but we've got a private API for us and it exposes all the data in JSON including all the IDs from the different data sources when available and so on. So uh, we also made some API uh, entries for the displaying stats uh, for example, uh, if I click on a, on a song, uh, I want to know all the available uh, um, fields uh, that are uh, associated with songs. So you can see that we've got 2 uh, million songs, but uh, only 1,077,000 have a language uh, information. Uh, only 3,000 songs are, have currently a multi-track uh, set of, of files associated and so on. So we've got also statistics about album albums. So we've got a release date for nine, 90 thousand of them out of 20 thousand and so on. So I'm not going to click on every every link. Uh, we've got also stats per language. Uh, so we've got most of the songs in English and then in Spanish and um, so we've got all sorts of API. Uh, uh, and tries for that. So the problem we, we've got was, uh, the first problem was matching the audio files because the desired data set, uh, the, the desired um, number of songs is about several millions, I think. Uh, much more than our two millions. And we managed to match 67% uh, uh, of the audio files with our entries. But uh, it was 87% if we only consider the English and French audio files we're going to focus on. So we used multiple heuristics and we are still working on that because Deezer is not buying albums. They are buying catalogs. So you find a David Bowie track, it's, on, it's not on any albums by David Bowie. What version is it? We don't know. The database also contains metadata that are poor. The genre of David Bowie is pop. Five, okay. Okay, and so on. So, um, read the paper. I, I started describing uh, the different heuristics we had to match the audio files. But the thing is that now a uh, song is more a YouTube song than a record song. And this uh, was a big problem also with the synchronized ly lyrics. People worked on YouTube, not on records. So, okay. Okay, so uh, here are some statistics about the matching. So we've, we, uh, our two million songs, only 70, uh, only 57 percent are on music brands, and so on. So our data set is, in a way, more complete than the other ones. Uh, at least it's really different. So we're not competing with uh, the other data sets, uh, but these numbers uh, are big and uh, show that we need to uh, um, focus. Uh, maybe not on the famous songs, but on the ones that have no metadata available on the web. And uh, uh, adding some information from the lyrics analysis, from the audio analysis, will, uh, will be a, uh, a big improvement. About the lyrics analysis, I don't have time, but we are working currently to align all the lyrics on the audio. This is the first step for uh, identifying the structure of the songs, lyrics, verse, and this uh, is a... Uh, 
a joint work with the people from the audio and people from the natural language processing. Uh, okay. Your microphone. Uh, microphone. Okay, so yes, we did um, audio, semantics, and, uh, and lyrics together. And for this, we would like to present one of our uh, framework we use uh, on maybe the audio side, not the semantic side, um, to make processing on audio. So there are a server part, which can be uh, uh, a system for doing um, scale audio processing. Uh, and time side, so is a framework for the web. There is a server part and a player part. Um, and it can do uh, audio processing, prototyping, audio dynamic visualization. Um, it can do also automatic segmentation and labeling. And sometimes there is a, an interface to, to make uh, manual uh, annotation uh, in a collaborative way. And this is, in fact, uh, a new audio web service system so, uh, and I will show you some demos uh, this afternoon, so I will go really fast. Uh, TimeSight has an architecture which is uh, stream streaming oriented, so that um, we can add some different Python process on the server side. Uh, it can also be uh, VOM, VOM processing with, uh, with bridges or essential bridges. And we stream the results in different formats in the browser, on the server, so that we can have a data persistence on the, on the whole uh, platform. And also, of course, in one pipe, we can uh, transcode the, the audio to provide it to the, to, to the browser. Uh, TimeSight ha has a rather simple IP API uh, specification for the processing. So we have an example here, which is a, just a dummy analyzer, uh, which several uh, methods really simple, uh, setup, ID, name, process, and post-process, so that you can define really simply uh, um, a, put, a processing prototype for, for, for the system. And there is also a namespace in, uh, defined in Python, so when you set up a new plugin, a new module, a new Python module, which is called, uh, which called, um, which called the namespace uh, time side, it, automatically it is automatically available for this, the system. Um, when you want, so our problem is to scale the, the whole thing on the big uh, semantic database. So we have to scale also the audio uh, analyzing system. So TimeSide is already uh, Docker packaged, so that you can have an example uh, to uh, to set up the TimeSide as a web service uh, on the server part and to scale it over a bunch of workers so that you can uh, trig all the tasks you have defined uh, on the, in the database to trigger all the, um, the, the process uh, tasks. You have an example here of what, um, what is old and what is new in, in bold. What is new, um, it has been, um, yes, thank you. It has been, those um, processors has, has, have been um, coded and specified and coded by uh, several uh, partners uh, in France. And uh, there are, you, you see, uh, speech detection, music detection, uh, single voice detection algorithms. Uh, of course, it has to be tested more. Uh, these are, well, there are, there are prototypes for now. We have also a RESTful API. So this is a new, the interesting part for, for us. Uh, defining, so, uh, defining a full API for the audio processing uh, server. TimeSet has also a web player on the client side. So this is the old fashioned uh, one. And this is a new one. This is just, just uh, a sketch, but I will have some demos uh, this afternoon. Um, we make, building this new player, we, make, we made a big, big assumption, which is maybe unusual for us in web audio, which is we don't make any audio uh, duration limit. So our, our constraint is to uh, be able to, to, uh, to take maybe one, one, two, three hours of audio in the, in the browser. So we have a push-pull system in the, in the player 
so that we can uh, use uh, the server to uh, send us some audio packets um, in, a in a streaming way, so that we can deal with uh, a whole uh, yes, a whole uh, big archiving system. So Tempset is integrated in Telemeta, which is uh, the whole platform for um, MIR, Medicology, and archiving uh, um, implementation system. So it's, uh, it's become what we can call MIR, uh, MIR archiving. <coughs> yeah. um, so I, I will have some demos uh, on the server side for processing with uh, notebooks and uh, documentation, <coughs> and also for the new player. For the conclusion, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The conclusion. We we are late. Okay. So the um, some of the tools are already used in music schools, and um, uh, there are some videos in the presentation. We will publish the URL of the presentation, and uh, the database is online at wasabi.ifreest.unis.fr. If you click on the button on the top right, and the login with WAC. 2017, WAX 2017, you will have a temporary access to the copyrighted data, I mean the lyrics, the multitrack, and you can play with that. On the left, you, you have links to the API, API to, to, give, to, to try it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we'll keep moving along. I think, Charlie, you're next? Yeah. So while Charlie's setting up, we could uh, field yeah. a question or two, if, if, if uh, okay. So, Mike? Yeah. Um, this, this could be a big question, but um, in the context of this database, what, how do you define a song? What, what? How do you define a song for this database? Define a song? So, yeah. What is a song? Uh, what is a song? Okay, I, I, okay a song is, um, okay. Oop. Sorry, API, no. Okay, uh, a song as a, for the moment, uh, we, we grabbed many data from music brands and so on. So we got the lyrics, we got the abstract, we got the, 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 the reference to the album, the producer, the, the, the publication date, uh, everything we could get from the, from the, the web. And we are adding, uh, as soon as it, it will be ready, data from the music extraction retrieval and data from the lyrics analysis. I guess so Music Brains distinguishes between compositions and releases. Mm -hmm. How does your idea of a song interact with various recordings or various different compositions? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, so far when a song is available on different records, uh, uh, it appears in the discography, but uh, we, for example, li live versions that uh, have not been published. No, okay, okay. It, uh, a song is something that has been published. Yes, it must have a uh, what uh, numero An ISBN or uh, yeah. But it, it, it's a big question because we have many covers in the database, and what is the original? What is the copy of the cover? It's it's really difficult. We, we, we can maybe we can tell the, the best. The, the real song will be what we can define as the, the best. Uh, um, maybe uh, the best number in statistics to to obtain something which is well documented. So the metrics are not already completely defined, but uh, maybe this will uh, happen at, at the end if we have the good metrics. But it's a really hard question. Okay, well, thanks. So we'll move along, and I'm sure. Okay, we'll so opportunities. come to talk with us. For sure. Welcome, uh, Charlie Roberts, for his uh, next talk here. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, good morning everybody. So I'm going to be talking about strategies for per sample processing of audio graphs in the browser. I'll start with a little overview. Um, first, I'm going to kind of define what per sample processing of audio graphs means in this paper and presentation. I'll talk about why we might want to do it, why we might not want to do it in the context of the browser. And then I'm going to talk about two um, libraries that I've been working on. One is a, a new library I'm presenting for the first time today called Genish.js. The other one is an, an older library that I've completely rewritten from scratch on top of Genish.js, and this, this uh, older library is called Gibberish.js. And then I'll briefly discuss um, some evaluation of this. So per sample processing, um, for purposes of this presentation, I'm defining it as audio graph processing alg algorithms where each node outputs a single sample at a time as opposed to blocks of multiple samples. And as many of us are users of the Web Audio API, we know that the nodes that come included with the browsers output blocks of samples um, at once. In order to do per sample processing, we have to use a script processor node or the upcoming um, audio worklet. And that kind of brings us to the why not of per sample processing, because the script processor node currently has a lot of penalties with it. Increased latency, um, running in the main thread, which can lead to audio interruptions, and also lower efficiency than the built-in um, audio unit generators. So then we might come to, well, why would we actually want to do this? And per sample processing brings a lot of advantages and a lot of synthesis techniques to the table that you can't do with uh, block-based methodologies. And so I'm going to briefly kind of talk about a, a couple of these um, and give a couple of demos and coming from my personal history with digital synthesis or digital and analog synthesis. So this is actually uh, me and my guitar, um, a Moog Liberation. It's a two oscillator analog synthesizer. Uh, and uh, I was really familiar with subtractive synthesis or fairly familiar with it when I got this guitar, but there was a, a, a switch and a knob on there that I hadn't come across before, which was for a technique called hard sync. And hard sync is a pretty standard um, synthesis technique in subtractive synthesis, where if you have two oscillators, you synchronize the phase of a slave oscillator to a master. And that roughly looks like what I've got in this image right here, where at the top, I have a master sawtooth oscillator, and every time um, the, the master oscillator completes one cycle of oscillation, it resets the phase of the slave oscillator, uh, resulting in a new waveform for the slave oscillator and new timbres. And as you increase or decrease the frequency of that slave oscillator, you get more new waveforms, different waveforms, and different timbres and harmonics. So just by changing the frequency of that slave oscillator, you can get a really wide variety of sounds. So I'll show this really briefly in a demo um, in Genish.js. So Genish.js is a port of the Gen extension um, for doing per sample processing inside of MaxMSP. Uh, so in MaxMSP, you can typically use block rate audio processing, uh, but Gen is a language that allows you to do per sample processing without having to write your own custom C++ externals. And so I thought that it might be nice to port it to the browser so that existing Max users could write JavaScript using an API that they were familiar with. I also got to um, learn the API fairly well through working uh, with a, a colleague of mine, Graham Wakefield, who's one of the authors of Gen on a, a, a live coding project that I'll be using in a performance tomorrow and really appreciated the design of it. So this example here on the left is just a bunch of end user code. The top six lines are what create the, the hard sync and the bottom lines are to do a little bit of um, pattern sequencing. So I'll just go ahead and play this. So that's kind of the like stereotypical sound of um, hard sync in subtractive synthesis. And it's something you can't realize without having the ability to manually reset the phase of an oscillator at arbitrary points of time um, based on where the master oscillator actually is. Uh, but it's not just useful to use per sample for emulating analog synthesis techniques. It's also a critical component of some fundamental digital synthesis techniques. So this is the first digital synthesizer that I ever owned. Uh, the Yamaha TX81Z was given to me by my uncle on my 14th birthday. I had no idea what FM synthesis was, but you could make helicopter noises with it from a MIDI controller, and I thought that was really cool. Um, turns out the way that it works is you have four oscillators 
Um, so it's a slightly different configuration than the DX7, which you might be more familiar with. But you have four oscillators that can be routed in different ways that Yamaha terms algorithms. And the important thing to notice in these algorithms is that in every one, oscillator number four has a feedback path in, in it. Uh, which basically means that oscillator number four can output a single sample. That single sample can then be used to modulate the frequency of that oscillator on the next sample. And you can create these feedback loops that create wild variations in sound. So I'm going to show a, a brief demo of um, two operator FM synthesis using feedback in um, the other environment I'm presenting today, which is gibberish. So gibberish um, is basically a higher level library um, for doing DSP using per sample techniques that has things like synthesizers and chorus effects and reverbs and FM pre-built, whereas Genish is kind of like a, a much more lower level set of tools to write the underlying DSP. So basically all the DSP that I used in, G, um, in gibberish are compiled Genish functions that get generated. So I'm going to play this example right now. It's a polyphonic FM example that's just going to fade over time, uh, let's say over 20 seconds. And there's a feedback parameter that's going to uh, gradually increase alongside the amplitude envelope. So this is just two oscillators and some feedback and some reverb and chorus effects that we're listening to here. So you can hear how it starts and ends with some pretty pure sounds, but gradually evolves into these really complex spectrum. And a lot of that is due to the, the use of FM feedback uh, inside the simple patch. So both fundamental analog and digital synthesis techniques, in order to, to implement them, uh, you, you need to use these per sample techniques. But it also brings a lot to the table in terms of thinking about scheduling and how we uh, sequence inside of the browser. So I'm going to show an example here of um, audio rate modulation of, of scheduling. Uh, I'm going to make, let's do this, let's do eight car plus strong um, physical models that'll be controlled by sequencers. And then each one of the sequencers um, is going to have a sine wave that's going to vary the speed that it triggers note at, notes at. Um, so we'll hear how that sounds. And we'll hear the, the, the strings kind of gradually come in and fit out of phase with one another. So doing this type of uh, modulation, you can basically take any audio source and use it as an audio rate modulation for any scheduling um, that you're running using these types of, of per sample techniques. And you can see inside um, the generated output function here where, um, let's see, where's a good example. So here's a sequencer. It's being fed by whatever value 45 is. Value 45 is equal to the output of a sine wave plus one. So that basically just determines the phase increment for the sequencer. Uh, on each sample of the playback that occurs. There are lots of other cool things you can do with per sample processing techniques. This is just kind of a sample and, and a, a couple of different demos to get us started um, discussing this. Uh, but now I'd like to go back and discuss uh, what these libraries, how they actually work in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so I mentioned Janish is based on the Gen extension for Max MSP, and the, the fundamental idea with Janish is to create extremely low level uh, unit generators that do one thing and one thing only. So there's a unit generator that reads a value from a buffer, or a unit generator that writes a value to a buffer, or a unit generator that adds two unit generators together. Um, they're very low level, which means they're very easy to write unit tests for. So there's a, a testing suite that comes with Genish.js to ensure that it is reliable and it's going to work in the way that you expect it to work. 
So here's an example of um, the end years of code for GenSJS to just uh, basically to make a, a sawtooth, an aliasing sawtooth oscillator. And then the function that Gen is going to compile for you to create an optimized representation um, of that unit generator. And so if we look right here, um, this accumulator, basically you specify a phase increment for it to be incremented by on each sample and a minimum or maximum value for it to wrap between. And then we get this resulting function, which we can plug into a script processor node. And there's utility functions come with both libraries for taking the compiled functions and plugging them into script processors. Um, the first thing that's important is there's a single block of memory that's used by all, um, all unit generators inside of a Genish callback function. And there's also a single block of memory that's shared by all the Genish DSP um, underlying callbacks when you're using gibberish. It, it'll send a single block of memory to all the different um, compiled Genish functions. And that gives you a, a massive performance increase. It's the same technique uh, used in asm.js. And actually, genish.js can, can also compile to asm.js uh, in another branch. So we have this one value of memory that we read in. We increment that one value. We wrap it if necessary. And then uh, we output it. And so this is just one single UGIN that's compiled. You can imagine with um, uh, something more complicated, like a complicated reverb lo uh, model, the, the resulting code is, is hundreds of lines in length. Um, so gibberish JS, again, the, the main idea here is that we're going to have a higher level system. We're not worried about low level things like reading a value from a buffer or writing to a buffer, but higher level synthesis objects like uh, the synthesis objects we already heard, there's virtual analog filter models inside of there, multiple different reverb models to choose between from, um, uh, lots of other things um, inside of there to play around with that are at a higher level where you can use it to make music, uh, including some built-in schedulers uh, that we already saw uh, in effect today. And so here's an example of what gibberish looks like. Just three um, high-level objects. Again, a synthesizer, a chorus that's using that uh, synthesizer as an input, connecting it to the master bus, and a three-oscillator monosynth that's being connected to the master bus. And gibberish then compiles that into the following JavaScript function. Um, each one of the different um, values that's passed into the function is a genish.js callback function. Um, that these higher level gibberish objects wrap. So when I call synth21, what I'm actually doing is calling a, uh, a genish um, JS function, passing it in a bunch of parameters. And as I mentioned, that single block of memory that's used by all the synthesis objects inside of the gibberish graph. So I can combine um, these three things together. And then again, these easily plug into a script processor node uh, to be able to use for musical programming. So there's a few different ways um, we can evaluate these libraries, and I go into um, them in the paper. Really, today, I'm just going to talk about one which may or may not be the least interesting, which is the efficiency. Uh, but here's a table taken from this chart comparing the performance of GenishJS to the native web audio nodes in three arbitrarily selected tests. And there's no way you can make any conclusive claims about the performance of GenishJS from um, these charts, I just want to point them out to make some very broad, possible, speculative ideas out there. So we'll notice that in a test of uh, 100 sine oscillators running for a minute, um, that actually runs fastest uh, using GenSJS under Chrome, um, and slowest running GenSJS under Firefox. 50 sine oscillators with vibrato runs fastest using the native web audio API nodes in Chrome. Uh, and slowest using the native nodes in Firefox. 50 saw oscillators with envelopes running for a minute runs fastest in Chrome, and then um, GenishJS has kind of takes the biggest hit of all right here uh, at uh, 11,281 milliseconds. Um, but I think even with that value, it's actually within you know four times of the values generated by the native nodes that are operating at block rate 
uh, processing. And, and running at block rate brings lots of efficiency, even in statically compiled languages like C++. So uh, these are just a few tests, and you can run other tests, and they're going to create different results. The tests are available. There's a link in the paper. Uh, you can play around with them yourself. But really, all I, I want to say with this is that this seems to be tolerable to me, and it seems to be uh, you, you know, you can do this type of processing inside the browser and get results that don't make it prohibitively expensive to, to actually be able to use. The flip side of that is that as of now, we still have to use a script processor node to do that, uh, which kind of brings me, I think, to the, the conclusion, which is that here I, you know, I've introduced a couple of libraries. One is genish.js, a, a port of this library for Maximus P that provides a lot of really low-level operators for creating optimized JavaScript callbacks. And the other is gibberish.js, which is a, a basically wraps JS, uh, Genish JS with a bunch of higher level objects. Um, and what I'm hoping is that with the introduction of the audio worklet as these penalties that we've had with per sample processing kind of vanish, that, that maybe people will be more encouraged to employ per sample um, processing techniques uh, inside of the browser. Um, and this provides a way to do that um, entirely JavaScript to end to end. The other alternative, which is also excellent, is to use something like Faust or C sound and compile to, to asm.js. But those are really the, the kind of the only two options that are available right now, as I know. And uh, I'll take some questions. Thank you. So um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I really don't know much about um, ASM, but uh, I think there, there is some, some kind of similar ideas in what you're doing with combining directly to ASM. So I was wondering, what would there be any advantage to trying to use uh, ASM directly? So I, I have a branch that compiles to ASM.js, and um, it, for whatever reason, it performs worse. Um, and I haven't figured out why that is it, it, uh, exactly. I guess I, I'm speculating that, as you say, there's similar design things and that the, the use of the single memory block is, is the largest of the performance advantages that's possibly gained and maybe the additional type information that ASM.js provides isn't quite as important or it could just be the or, you know, bad coding uh, that I did with ASM.js. I just don't know yet. Uh, one of the things I am interested to try out is um, the automatic conversion that you can enable in Chrome that converts ASM.js to WASM.js uh, and see if converting it to WebAssembly does give, give better performance than what I'm getting out of ASM.js. Further question? So I'm, I'm curious, uh, just on, you know, you're running in script processor node, you've got uh, sample synchronous and, uh, you know, popping back and forth in the main thread and keeping track of the sample clock. How's that going, you know, if you're using uh, the sample clock to meter something, you know, sort of higher level in your compositional Yeah, so I mean, I use it, um, and I didn't mention this, but these will, these libraries will eventually go into Jibber, the live coding system that I use on it. Even in the, the version of gibberish that I'm using now in Jibber, I mean, I do performances where I do 3D visuals. I have these code annotations that run while I perform. And I can still, you know, if I'm careful, I can still get through a performance without having ridiculous crackles and pops uh, that, that go through out of it. Maybe I misunderstood your question. Yeah, it's more about coordinating uh, higher level sort of events with, with the sample clock, you know. And you showed a little bit with the sign control of uh -huh. R plus strong. But is it, does that generalize nicely so that, you know, you can sort of reach deep down into the, you know, per sample from, you know, object creation? Yeah, well, you're, I mean, yeah. you're going to be limited by the block in terms of how you can interact. So you still with, have that, yeah. Yeah, you still yeah, have that boundary to deal with. still the granularity of the block yeah. there. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, yeah. Okay. So it'll go away. Right? It, <laughs> Good. So uh, we, we're, we're going to move on, and uh, let's, let's thank Charlie for talking to him.
Um, so a slight switch of events. The, the paper that's advertised next is, um, is going to have to sort of fly in telematically, and there's a little bit of trouble connecting right now. So we're going to skip over, and uh, next paper will be uh, uh, Benjamin and uh, LFO, a graph-based modular approach to the processing of data streams. Um, and I'm going to present you Waves LFO for low frequency operators that we have designed with Norbert Schnell at Yakam. Um, so the, the library is a graph based modular approach to the processing of data streams. Uh, so far, we have used the library in our application for, for processing different types of data, such as live audio input, motion sensors data, and audio files. Um, the aim of this processing was generally to generate annotations, visualizations, to control synthesizers, and to record. Um, that's it. One, uh, one first interesting feature here that is that the um, library can be used both um, with uh, real-time and offline. Um, the type of processing, as you can see, is much more like standard stuff like scaling, filtering, segmentation. Um, the two last one are kind of not so... Uh, no, I don't know how to say that. Uh, for data flow control and network communication. Um, okay, so... The, um, a few words about the concept of the, um, of the library. Um, so first, the, um, here the, the word afferent stream is just a fancy word to say that um, the library is mostly about dimensionality reduction. Um, so the, um, the library defines three categories of modules. So we have sources that are rep responsible to acquire the data and to produce um, valid LFO streams. On the other side, we have sinks or outputs that can, that can take multiple forms, uh, such as visualization, control, storage. And in the middle, we have the operators that are just basic units to which actually apply transformation on the data. Um, one important thing is that, is that this basic taxonomy allows to really naturally define a clear separation of concern between what is um, generic and what is uh, platform specific. That means that we can reuse uh, the a world graph just by changing the source and sinks and we use it in, a, in another platform that relies on a different API. Um, a stream is defined by, by this attribute. Um, the idea is that each operator, each unit can change the, this attribute to, to kind of um, to kind of describe the, um, the operations they, made on, they make on the stream. For example, uh, an FFT operator would change the frame type because the input signal and the output are really different types. And the frame size too would be changed to reflect the FFT size, for example. So um, a stream is 
a succession of frames in time. So we have um, we have formalized this this frame as, as a really simple structure. It's a simple JavaScript object uh, with a time tag and um, and data, which is the payload of the frame. Um, in each module, the data is represented by a float32 array and is reused frame to, to, from frame to frame to minimize memory allocation. Um, okay. So the data can be of two types, which are not really, probably not mathematically completely correct, but have the merit to be really explicit and straightforward, um, which is signal, it's just um, a successive values in time in the one dimension, and vector is all the data uh, associated to the same time, but in different dimensions. So, implementation. Um, not really implementation, usage. Uh, so we have to import the library. Um, just in this single line, there's the, you can see that we import the waves LFO slash client, which give you access to all the sources and things that are specific to browsers, such as um, interfacing with web audio API, um, and everything you can find in a browser. <laughs> then you have just to create a new new object. So here we have um, a source that is able to take the buffer of a web audio node and just uh, slice it into frames, uh, root mean square and a logger. Then you connect everything together and initialize and start the, the graph. Uh, the initialization is asynchronous because uh, as the source and things may, may rely on asynchronous APIs such as databases or something like that, we need this step to, to be sure that the graph is ready to, to process the, the stream. Um, it's also, although we tested that, it's not completely formalized, but it's also allow to use WebAssembly modules that rely also on an as asynchronous initialization. Uh, for implementing a module, um, you just have to extend the base LFO class, define a bunch of parameters. This one is really kind of stupid example, but it works. Um, so by implementing the process vector uh, method, for example, you can you just define that this, uh, this new module can handle frame with, the, with this type vector, but not signal ones. Um, that's all. And then you can instantiate your new module just like this. Um, so the aim here is that uh, it was really a concern to, to create an API that is really easy to use for application developer, but also for people who make algorithms and stuff. And particularly when you have an algorithm, you just have to create this new module and it gives you access to a whole bunch of interfacing with potentially anything. Um, we have a set for now, but it could be extended for to interface with a lot of things. That's all. And then we have this little API that is much, much more a convention for now, um, but that allows to use a module outside of a graph. It's it's also useful when you want to create a higher level uh, module that consume lower level module. Yeah. And we run benchmarks. Uh, I won't go into the details of the benchmarks because 
uh, it, not really interesting, but you have all the details in the paper, the code is in the, um, is in the repository, so feel free to check out if you want. Um, the results we have are um, quite interesting. So we, we compared um, with a C++ implementation of a library that has almost the same uh, same uh, philosophy, um, and so we the the main idea sorry uh, was not to compare really low level things like my FFT is better than yours and something like that, but really to have a better idea of the global behavior and performance. Um, so. Interesting results are, are, for example, that uh, V8 so far is the slowest engine we have tested. Um, Safari is really fast, also it's surprising. But um, for mobile device, we are still uh, faster than real time, so, and it's really interesting because, uh, for especially in the kind of uh, application we make, it's really interesting to have this, uh, this feature. And the test we've made with WebAssembly is quite uh, nice too. It was on the FFT and we had a times two performance boost uh, on average. And uh, yeah, it could be really nice to wrap little WebAssembly modules in in LFO you need to, to do the number cr crunching. Okay, some examples, no? Oh, perfect. <laughs> so this is, um, I hope it works, yeah. Um, this is a mosaicing example, so it's, we can record something and say something. So, I don't know what to say. So, here it is. So um, <laughs> uh, I can talk with a dog voice. And the idea is just to um, record um, the audio stream and then we process it with MFCCs and then with a cane and go grab the, the sample that is the closest from the example. Um, the other example I have, I need my phone. Yeah. Oh, it's small. So here I'm basically um, Typing the sensors of my mobile phone in through the network uh, and then visualize it. And there's not a single line of code in this example that is not LFO based actually. So it's it can be really practical for debugging and stuff like that. And I will just show you the graph. Um, simplified of this application. The idea is just to take the sensors, uh, send them through the network on the server. It was Eduroam, actually, the network. Um, and then resend it back to, to, the, to, to the desktop client. Then we scale everything for the visualization, select and, and display each uh, each uh, axis text in a canvas. Um, what is interesting here is that we could potentially insert uh, uh, some uh, recording something <laughs> in the server or something like that. Um, we could um, use that to test uh, a filter, for example, and run it in the desktop and then just 
put it back into the mobile phone. And, yeah. and that's all. Thanks. This is the guitar. Oh, thanks for a great talk. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, when you built these processing graphs, you said they are um, graphs, so can they have loops and, and branches? And no, like no, that? not loops. Okay. No feedback. You can have some branches, but and maybe if you yeah, The important idea is that for all these things we do there, we don't need that, so we skipped it. <laughs> Which makes it very simple. Further? I guess I have one question. I, maybe I missed it, but uh, why the name LFO? Because it's funny. <laughs> because it's <laughs> funny. <laughs> Good. Okay. Didn't didn't have an acronym in there. Like uh, uh, the acronym is low frequency operator. Yeah, but but a, a pun <laughs> on that. Yeah. Okay. You know. Sorry, it was my. <laughs> it's you know, marketing, actually. <laughs> you know. You know, large and fast objects. I don't know. So, um, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and now uh, queuing up, Michael Brzezinski, and uh, he's going to speak on uh, write once, run anywhere, revisited with uh, machine learning and audio tools in the browser with C++ and Inscriptum. Microphone. Oh yeah. Microphone. All right, that's working. Um, so there are a lot of things I could say here. Here I am again with Rapid Mix, somewhat affiliated with Waves LFO. Um, but I'm going to speak mostly about my perspective. This was kind of an interesting thing where Mick and Matt and Leon wrote a paper, and I wrote a paragraph, and then they all went on holiday, and now I'm the primary author. Woohoo! Um, so anyway, we've written. Um, well, at Goldsmiths, we have a bunch of students who want to get involved in making, um, you know, making audio, making vid video online. So how are we going to deal with this? Um, and this, this kind of connects to what I think is a meta theme in these presentations. Why on earth are we doing audio in a browser anyway? Um, I'm, I'm sort of old enough, actually my first synth was also a TX81Z, um, to, to remember having to do audio on the server in the basement. And then finally, I have these performant computers and I don't have to buy Code Warrior. I have a great IDE. Everything's cool. So why are we back in the browser? Um, and I ask myself that a couple of times a week. And sometimes I am not really sure. But sometimes it's, it's for these reasons. That um, you, know, you have a classroom full of students. Rather than, all right, everybody download this. Everybody install this. Oh, you're in a lab. You don't have admin access. Um, you know, all of the things that I'm sure many of you have encountered with software, we can get right in to writing code, getting people doing things. I really like to have people making sound as quickly as humanly possible. Um, and you know, we, so we want um, rapid results, um, which kind of connects into prototyping. Rapid prototyping is one of the, um, one of the methodologies of the grant I'm on. Um, so all of these are well, well served by the browser. The last one is an inter interesting punchline. Um, I think a lot of you know about Macs. I've used Max a little bit, and it's great until you want to make a product out of it, and then you've hit a wall. Um, so we wanted to maintain this possibility, um, both because that's also a parameter of the grant, but because we want that wall not to be there. We want, if you're going to go and take the thing you wrote in the browser, and you want to build that into an app, we want a pathway for advanced users to do things like that. Um, so that all sort of conspired for this workflow of 
writing a bunch of things in C++, both machine learning and audio, transpiling them using mscripten, and sticking that all in a browser-based IDE that you know, does all the things that um, make it easier for students to write code. Um, so just as an aside, how many of you have used this mscripten pathway? A few of you? Oh, not as many. So I, a lot of presentations I see say, all right, and then we put it through an mscripten and it worked. It's not true. It's a real pain in the neck. Um, so I just wanted to mention a few things if you're going this way, is that um, it's not always the case that the best API I could write in C++ is going to make the best API I could write in JavaScript. Um, for instance, I want to pass a standard vector of doubles to something in C++. Well, what the heck is that in JavaScript? It turns out you have to export a thing from mscript in, and then you have like a special class, and then I have a bunch of wrapper code to convert JavaScript arrays. It's a pain in the neck. But you want to use them because there's no such thing as a destructor in JavaScript either. So if you try to use arrays, you're just allocating memory that you're never going to be able to give up. Um, and you might want to pass pointers. You might, um, I actually was sitting wondering if I was going to port JSON CPP to JavaScript using mscript in, um, which sort of, you know, I knew that a daemon would just pop up out of the desk and take me straight to hell if I did that. But um, so there are all these interesting problems in this design setup. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of been my day-to-day -day experience for the last couple of years. Um, but on to what we've done. So in addition to audio, which we've talked a lot about, I spent a lot of time working on machine learning, specifically um, this paradigm we're calling interactive machine learning. Um, hopefully many of you saw the demos we were giving yesterday. Um, the idea with interactive machine learning is that um, we're using small sets of data. Training is very fast. You don't spend a lot of time on quality control of your model, apart from is this doing something I like or is it not doing something I like? So I think there's this classical machine learning idea of, oh yeah, I have 10 terabytes of data and I'm going to train for a month and I have like six GPUs jammed into this computer and it's going to set on fire. And um, you know, that's how you train something to win at Go. But if you just want to map you know, 80 EMG signals to a synthesizer with 12 parameters, you can do that in a much more lightweight way. So that's, that's the side I've implemented, um, and it's a thing called RapidLib. So I've written a machine learning library in C++ and put it into JavaScript that just gives you really simple, you know, all right, here I've got a regression object, here I'm going to create some training data, which is input-output pairs, you know, when, I, when you get this, I want that, when you get this, I want that, and you just say train, and you say run, and you don't really, you know, there's no covariance test set, you know. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of intellectual material <coughs> in machine learning that's really interesting, but not necessary at this point. Um, and in, in our world, that rapid lib in the things I'm going to show is prepared with Maximilian, which is an audio library that um, my colleague Mick primarily wrote. Um, so that started off its life as a C++ library. So if you already have a C++ library laying around, the inscription pathway looks even more appealing. Um, and that runs in open frameworks and, and all kinds of environments there. And this was ported over, again, to do kind of more, um, you know, more like sample-based processing. You know, an API that I think audio people are going to be happy with learning. Um, so not the graph model of the web audio API, but you know, here I can create an oscillator. Um, oh, look, that oscillator. Oh, yeah, and I just say, you know, play it. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not nearly as feature complete as some other audio APIs, but it's a good starting point for, for people learning how to do these things. And um, here's a picture that um, you might expect. So in fact, in this browser IDE, we have, I think, everything you'd need to build a new musical instrument. We've got sound synthesis and analysis, um, getting sensors into the browser. That's a whole other question and complaint I'll make later. Um, things are processing, and everybody's favorite script processor node is our friend here, um, or enemy, or what. Um, and so that's all put together into this thing called Code Circle, which is yet another browser-based IDE. Um, I think it's better off that I show it. This is what it says in the paper. So this is what it looks like, but I can do that in real life. So here's, um, oh, look at that. Um, uh, let me get that onto the right screen. Um, um, 
hello you. Um, oh yeah, my implementation of this is interesting. Uh, Apple's um, you know multiple screen thing is kind of uh, I didn't predict how that was going to work with the projector. All right, let's do that, and then that, and then that, and then that. Hello. All right, I have a technical moment where I have to get what I see on the screen. Arrangement, mirror. Ooh, resolution is awesome. Um, OK, here's Code Circle. Um, it looks a lot bigger on a higher resolution screen. Um, but I could, do, uh, I could do that thing. I think that patch was called Shader Madness. Um, so this has nothing to do with audio, but it looks really cool. Um, which is a whole bunch of OpenGL stuff um, drawing away. Um, and this is the basic IDE. As I say, it's kind of um, tiny. But um, you, know, you could write JavaScript and CSS and HTML5 in here. Um, you have a whole bunch of libraries. Um, can I get enough of the menus to see the libraries? Um, oh, this isn't my document, so I can't. Um, but you have a whole bunch of functions in there. Let me get let me get to something that I've actually written, so we can we can see it. Am I still logged in? Um, let me log in. Um, and my documents. Um, I think this works. Um, okay, so here's um, here's this thing. It's got uh, libraries. You can add some of the things that you might want to add, um, not one, but two different versions of Maximilian, um, jQuery, 3JS, you know, some, some, of, some of the more relevant to arts programming libraries. And you can do things like sharing and forking. Actually, if I hit download, everything, all the dependencies are packed into one big file. So the library, you'd get jQuery as a 64-bit binary blob at the beginning of your HTML file. But you'd have an HTML file that had no code circle dependency. Um, and is this actually running? Oh yeah, error found. And it does things like error checking. Um, it's found an error in my code. That's great. Um, so let me see if I can show you something interesting here. Um, yeah, here's video. Um, perfect. So I'm going to hide hide that code window. Um, so here's a you know maybe I want to use video as a controller for audio. I think I actually have some audio in this example now, too. Um, let me... Beautiful. Um, uh, oscillator. Um, I'm going to shut that off for a moment. So here I've got video. I'm going to record. I'm going to make a classifier. And so in machine learning, a classifier is a thing that basically says, all right, you're either looking at this class or that class or the other class. So I'm going to train a bunch of class 0, um, which is just my background stuff. And I'm going to train class one of me holding this cup. Ah, not bad. I need a little more one over here. All right, so maybe I need a little bit more zero. All right, so class zero. Hmm, this is a crummy classifier. Um, let me try my old standby, which is the phone. Um, run anyway. Um, so that's the fun thing about these interactive demos. All right, class zero is me doing that. Class one is me doing this. OK. Zero, one. One's right here. So I was very specific. I should do some more ones over here. All right, that's one. Brilliant. And it is driving sound beautifully. And here's where the interactive part comes in. You know, maybe I want another class. I want this to be class three. Where was three? <laughs> Let's train more of it. And this is, so that's the quality control for the model is me. There we go. Um, is my friend the cup going to play in this game? Here's four. So, so one stupid musical instrument really quickly. 
Um, and so that's the rapid prototyping idea. You know, I didn't spend any time thinking about, you know, pixels or brightness or any of that. I'm just right into when I do this, I want that. When I do this, I want that. And I think that's um, an important part of rapid prototyping and artistic prototyping that even though I'm a programmer, I don't want to sit and think about programming when I'm sitting and thinking about an artistic result. Um, by the way, all of this classification is just munging on raw pixels at this resolution over here. Um, so surprisingly, it works. I, I, I don't know why. Um, uh, I could show you one more thing really quickly, um, which is uh, this one. Um, you know, another type of classification. Um, um, actually, I'm feeling more inspired about where are my documents? Um, my documents. To be more hardcore audio about it, um, um, Maximilian does both synthesis and it does um, analysis, so I can do um, MFCCs. Um, so here I have. Um, here I have a classifier, basically the same interaction. Um, I'm going to record some silence. And now I'm going to record a little bit of Albert Eiler. Actually, pardon me a second. This is actually a microphone demo, so. OK, so it's identifying 1 and 0 and 1 and 0. Super. And now it's Ella Fitzgerald. She gets to be two. Ella Fitzgerald is never as stable, but it's basically working. I've got strong Eiler. When you hear Albert Eiler, you know you're listening to Albert Eiler. It's really the deal. Um, uh, let me give another couple of twos. Not a bad one, um, but the cool thing, I hope I can get this all on the same screen. Here's an Albert Eiler song I haven't heard yet. Um, and that's coming up. Eh, I could do better. Um, how about I? But Ella Fitzgerald, it's better at identifying a different Ella Fitzgerald song than it was on the training Ella Fitzgerald song. Um, so I've given this demo a few times with a number of different interesting but maybe imperfect results. Um, but so that, there you go in a nutshell is machine learning, audio feature extraction, and audio output all in the same package. Let's see where I am on time. One minute. One um, minute. All right, so I was here. Um, so just to get to the end of it, um, so that's the trip we're working on. Um, there's a whole lot in the paper about different ways we found to get sensor data into the web. This is another moment where the browser actively hates me, right? Like, God forbid I could just send OSC into a browser window. That would be horrible. Like, so all this security, all this nonsense, but um, game pads, um, web sockets work. Um, and the other thing that might interest some of you, um, at the end of the day, here's efficiency. Um, so, I wrote the neural network stuff, and I think it's pretty good. Um, so, in the C++ world, you know, we're looking at kind of three times, three, four, five times as slow um, C++ to JavaScript, which is what I would expect out of ASM. Um, in the audio world, there's some interesting results. So, for sine waves that are calculated, we're down a factor of 10. So about 300 sine waves we can do in C++ and about 30 in JavaScript. And then for reading out of a table with linear interpolation, we do even worse in JavaScript than we did calculating the sine wave, which is um, an interesting mystery to me. Um, and unfortunately, the question is, do I really go in and figure out what that's all about, or do I wait for audio workers or go to WebAssembly and just forget this ever happened? Um, so I think that's the state of web audio for us at Goldsmiths right now. Um, this is where you find Code Circle. This is where you find our whole RapidMix project. And uh, I'm glad to answer questions now or via email. Um. Great. So uh, questions, please.
wanted to ask you about uh, so the whole reason that you went through the, using the pipeline of writing C++ using mscripting. I was wondering if there was a point that like you could you, you would have you ever tested if you wrote the whole machine learning library in JS would that perform any better or worse than the mscripting version? Yeah, it's unfortunate. I've really thought about that and I think the proper way to test that would be to write the whole JavaScript library in JavaScript, and um, I don't really have the time or the will to do that. Um, so I've, I've been satisfied with the, oh, this performance isn't bad coming out of mscripten. Um, I think for me, the, the cool thing, the, the other cool important thing is that the C++ API looks exactly the same. So if you had prototyped a nice thing in a browser, you can save those models you trained as JSON and stick that into your Android app or run that on a Bella board. So um, even if the mscript and pathway just gave me average performing JavaScript, I think the advantages would keep me doing it. Um, although I would like it to be great performance. Um. Any further? Yeah, I guess we're, uh, we're all set. Thanks. It was, uh, yeah, it was a very lively day. <laughs>
one fit phrase description uh, that we like to use is uh, this idea of dynamic mapping of non-ocular environmental energies. And the motivation is basically looking at current maps which have to do, which are concerned with capturing visuals and uh, concerned with uh, representing static fixed objects like streets, buildings, rivers, and, and, and whatnot. And we thought about, uh, what about sound maps? Sort of these invisible energies that uh, we have in, uh, in environments. And a big problem, obviously, for sound maps is that these sounds dissipate pretty quickly. It's a dynamic uh, system. So uh, that uh, 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 came with a lot of challenges. And we tried to sort of uh, 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 solve some of these uh, uh, challenges in, in order to create these uh, so-called sound maps. So the city grant project, um, which uses this idea of edge compute, is basically uh, divided into four uh, sections. One is the sensor network, very important. We call this the, the plug and sense sensor network. Uh, and it's a citizen scientist driven uh, system where uh, the community gets in involved uh, in creating and scaling the sensor network, uh, machine learning visualization to uh, automate certain things, but also to allow the sharing of the data. And art and music, I won't talk about that too much today, uh, uh, which we uh, utilize as a way to bring awareness and disseminate uh, our, uh, our work. Uh, so this idea of plugging sense, sense and network is actually uh, uh, quite simple. And uh, uh, our efforts are uh, sort of driving this idea that more is better. And more meaning more sensors in a space is better. So here you can see the sensors in, a, in, a, in the environment, um, sending data to analytics at the edge. So in our case, we have uh, uh, fixed sensors or based on mass area highs and sending for computers and they basically do all the computation on the edge, at the edge, send the data to the server, high value data as you call it. Um, users can uh, visualize and get access to the data uh, from at their at their home. And I'll, I'll show you some of the interfaces briefly as well. And the sensor hardware started off with pretty expensive uh, um, uh, solutions that we thought were not very practical because they're expensive, bulky, and at the end of the day, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that using uh, um, readily available uh, hardware like, like this one, this was actually pretty interesting in the beginning, it's called uh, a mini PC, uh, which essentially is a sort of smartphone without all the uh, user interfaces, and this is a quad-core computer with uh, with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and uh, you just stick it in and it, it works pretty nice. So it runs on the on the Android um, operating system. We tried all these different types of hardware for sensor sensor uh, hardware uh, um, um, space, and currently our uh, own hardware. Uh, that we use is the Raspberry Pi, uh, which has become very uh, affordable, uh, quite powerful. And with the Raspberry Pi 3, it also has now uh, onboard Wi-Fi. Uh, so this idea from very expensive solutions and moving towards um, almost zero-cost solutions is what we're trying to uh, uh, get at at this point. And uh, here's some of our examples of uh, our hardware sensors. This was actually uh, built by our uh, friends and collaborators at Carl Arts. Uh, this is one that we use currently. Here's one at uh, EarCam, uh, which is this, this guy here. And um, uh, one of the latest prototypes is called the window sensor. So you can sort of see how this one works. Uh, imagine this is a window, like a window at your home. Uh, it uses uh, wireless um, uh, charging to charge the outside 
of the window uh, sensor, which is a uh, microphone, basically. So it's wireless, sense, uh, wireless sensitive in a sense. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we basically decided to move to JavaScript uh, and sort of uh, port all our code um, uh, to JavaScript because it was getting very uh, difficult to manage and rewriting code for different platforms was, was uh, very difficult for us. So and we also wanted it to be uh, um, um, executable on a web browser so that uh, many, many, uh, so that we could maximize uh, community involvement. So the web browser obviously works beautifully in JavaScript, and uh, if uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, um, if other devices that are not web browser based uh, 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 should be used, then no JS is used. So it allows the code base to become uh, uh, more manageable and uh, much more compact, and that's where we are currently uh, with our uh, system. And I'll briefly give you an uh, uh, overview of, of the uh, interfaces and some of the uh, uh, software we have. The main um, uh, interface is the, we call it this the globe, and I'm not sure if you can see it well, but uh, this is the main interface. Uh, as you can see here, these sort of uh, bars. This is all written in JavaScript, uh, in WebGL, and web audio. Um, you can see sort of these uh, sensors and the outputs of sensors in New York, for example. Um, uh, this is a heat map uh, uh, that's uh, uh, layered upon uh, Google Maps. Um, for example, here you can see the uh, second by second um, uh, feature vectors with this RMS for now, uh, minutes and then hours. You can also go over to uh, ear cam. We saw like four sensors uh, this past summer before coming to uh, went back to the US. Um, Uh, here's one over uh, there's this. I think, I think it's in front of some of the group. And um, another interface that's called Citigram is the real time analysis portion. Uh, so here is uh, the uh, analysis interface. And we're only showing uh, six features like this at this point. But uh, you can see. Uh, using web audio and uh, our own uh, quasi-threading mechanism. So one interesting thing that we uh, observed when using the web workers was that it was not very efficient with uh, garbage collection and uh, and uh, memory management. So we basically implemented our own sort of quasi-threading um, uh, module and that solved the uh, the resources that are available on Raspberry Pi, for example, it only has very small amount of memory, and we decrease it uh, significantly so that it works pretty well on uh, the Raspberry Pi. So that's the main interface. Um, and for some other situations where we don't want all this stuff and just want to uh, have like a standalone Raspberry Pi streaming. Uh, and sensing and computing the soundscapes, we have something called the uh, sampler. And you just enter your credentials and press uh, send, and it just sends the, uh, uh, the analyzed data to the server. Um, uh, another uh, software uh, we just developed is called the CityGram Bridge, which is basically this guy. And this allows you to get data streams from the browser to your local uh, computer. So this is uh, uh, implemented as a standalone uh, in Electron so that it gets um, um, WebSocket, uh, data through WebSocket, 
and then uh, the bridge uh, converts the web socket data, raw data into OSC. So, for example, I'm just uh, just uh, developing a installation for uh, 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 um, artwork in Seoul, where we're going to use CityGram to drive SuperFlyer. So, this would be sending OSC can be used in SuperFlyer or Max or any uh, software that. Uh, understands OSC. So these are the sort of main uh, three software that we're currently uh, using and developing um, and we're moving towards uh, machine learning and AI to um, do um, soundscape analytics and application automation so that we can uh, maximize the high value data, meaning bringing down bandwidth and um, uh, and uh, send the uh, data more effectively. So one interesting sort of um, software we've also developed, which will launch pretty soon, is called Kercha. And um, you guys probably know of the uh, um, um, capture uh, software that we use to see if you're a robot or not. So we use the same with audio, where we play a sound, or we play two sounds. One we know the uh, the truth, ground truth, and the other we don't. So if they get it right, we know they're not robots. And the uh, second sound, we uh, collect their, their labels. Um, so our current focus, as far as soundscapes are concerned, uh, we are uh, looking at noise pollution. And the motivation is that uh, for the first time in human history, we have more than 50% of the global population living in cities. And this is expected to increase to about 70%. So noise is becoming a big problem in New York City, for example. It is the number one complaint. But it's very complicated because it's a multi-dimensional uh, uh, sound is a multi-dimensional uh, uh, energy source. And it's spatially temporally uh, very uh, 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 rich and uh, omnipresent, so we want to scale the network so that we have as many nodes or many sensors uh, as possible, and hence the community involvement uh, uh, um, strategy. Uh, so our uh, project right now is sort of guided by this idea that you can't fix what you can't measure. That's our sense of network. Seeing and hearing is believing, which is our interface. And we, we want to provide uh, tools for the public, researchers, and artists, and policymakers to try to uh, mitigate noise uh, in these urban environments. Um, currently, we are uh, collaborating and partnering with uh, IBM on this as well. And they are very interested in IoT and cloud computing and edge compute. So um, there's some uh, air pollution sensors, weather sensors. Uh, this is part of Weather Underground, so we are looking into ways to incorporate sound maps into uh, Weather Underground, and this brings to see how this unfolds. And uh, that's basically it in, in a nutshell. And I think I have two more minutes uh, remaining. Um, there's more information on cityram.smusic.nyu.edu. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we're transitioning our research uh, as we uh, make the interface more robust um, towards uh, uh, machine learning and uh, classification. So um, uh, most of that stuff is currently offline, uh, including uh, the two main components are uh, acoustic event detection and acoustic event classification, and which uh, is uh, currently being developed so that we will have that online as well as part of the CityGram uh, platform. And I think that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey. Hey, Taeyang. <laughs> that was great. We, we heard it all very well and uh, saw it very well. So good. Yeah, yeah, nice. and. Uh, um, we can take some questions. Uh, I'll, I'll relay from, from the podium. Um, so if uh, anyone out there has something that I can relay, I will happily do that.
and it, it being lunchtime here, I think, you know, people are going, like, you know, <laughs> re, really, you know, two-step uh, two, two step querying is, is slow. But I've got a question, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you know, you've had enough time now accumulating data that I'm, I'm curious if you see, you know, uh, is it resolving any sort of large inflections, you know, like, would you be able to catch something like the 4th of July or actually what I'm really interested in is the eclipse. Did, oh, yeah. did you hear giant shouts of joy or uh, does that, does that come up in the data? A kind of, you know, massive. Well, uh, so I've actually forgotten about the eclipse, <laughs> but uh, that was actually one of the uh, things that I was trying to I had a similar project in, uh, you know, measuring CO2 in various capitals around the world, and, and uh, we just sort of, uh, I don't know, you know, fate rather than luck meant that we saw the inflection point of the SARS epidemic in Mexico City because it was quarantined, they shut down the schools, and the CO2 from the lack of uh, driving, there was a dip for a week. Like that. This that stuff's you know for policymakers yes, yeah. in particular, but it's, it's it's compelling to catch catch those things. So you will. There was a similar yeah. in the city when um, I think there was like a, a minute of silence. I think there were like hundred thousand people during Earth Day. Yeah. That's the thing. I was like, oh, if we had capital yeah. that, right? <laughs> the entire city become really quiet. Yeah. Um, but also more sort of natural or. Uh, uh, mundane patterns, right? Like uh, during the day, it's more uh, more noisy. During the evening, right. it sort of dies down and picks up, and then uh, in, in the wee hours, it's very quiet. But those are sort of expected. But how does that change over longer periods of time? What are the patterns? How does that how does that influence other elements, right? Like uh, time stats or uh, uh, living conditions or health or uh, uh, children's learning and these things are difficult to measure with one single modality. So we want to provide that data uh, to whoever wants to use it and uh, gain some more understanding. Great, it's a wonderful project. So uh, I can I can uh, get one more question from the audience. I'll relay it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the question is, um, uh, how are you dealing with privacy issues? Yeah, very, very good question. And that's really at the forefront of the many questions that we get. And in the beginning, we were actually, uh, we enabled audio streaming, so raw audio streaming, or uh, audio data streaming. Uh, from the edge, we have disabled that. So there's a couple of layers of uh, privacy security. Uh, one is edge computing. So everything happens on your own device. So you are in total control. So we don't have the analytics happen at the cloud, which allows us to not get the uh, not uh, have audio data be streamed to the cloud. So the audio data cannot be shared. So for example, you would send feature, uh, uh, feature vectors or uh, results of feature vectors like uh, you know, index 6 is the dog, uh, index 99 is the snake. Did I say snake? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So these data cannot be inverted, these data types cannot be inverted to get, let's, let's say, the voice data. Right? Uh, but we also experimented with audio stream, which is interesting, it's an interesting idea. 
uh, and we've added this uh, voice blurring algorithm so that it would mask the voice and you would sort of um, be able to tell what the sound is or what the sound state is, but the voice would be blurred. So it would sound like real, 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 that, and that. <laughs> and you know it's a person, but you don't know what that person is saying. Um, but uh, for, for, for now, we've disabled the audio screening uh, for bandwidth reasons, but also because of privacy. And I think at some point I will enable that again, and people who want to do it, they will be able to do it. Uh, but at this time, it's, it's disabled. Yeah. Thanks. Any further? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think I think we'll close there and thank you again for a you know wonderful presentation. It worked really well and uh, have have a nice breakfast in New York. So thank you very much. <laughs> Mark, uh, do you have any announcements or? Yeah. I was just to say on behalf of uh, Sebastian and Florian for the people who've got. Uh, demos and posters this afternoon to be here at quarter to two to, to prepare for the craze. Yeah, yeah. So please be here at quarter to two and put your. When can they put their things up? On behalf. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the t when you can put your posters up or set your demos up, everything should be there for you. Um, a quick reminder too that we're uh, asking you sometime around five o'clock maybe to start making your filling in the or your people's call uh, on the best presentations best demos and so on that would be very good and um is matt here yes you are would, would you be able to coordinate the folk from the api group to to do it that'd be great great thank you lunchtime thanks very much <laughs>